Well, let's get at it. I got a handful of things to share with you uh, during the, the last 15, 20 minutes of uh, Brother Campbell's message. I kind of restructured what I was doing, consolidated it. I didn't add any pages. I took away some pages because I, I have some things I want to talk about fairly freely, but I have a general direction of it, so let's see what we can do with it. Well, our topic was them that love God. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Bear in mind that in Romans chapter 8, you are not dealing with justification. You are not dealing with people who are just not understanding the gospel of the grace of God. They've already been through Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5, Romans 6, and Romans 7. Okay? So there's a progression to the maturity of a believer. Okay? I share that with you because we're right here in the middle of that. Okay? Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Let me stop right there for a second. Those of you who have been around me very long know what I'm going to do here. The word good is not necessarily saying all things work together for your good or my good. There's none good but God, right? When you read over there in, in Galatians, in Genesis 1, every time God created something, He says, and God saw that it was good, right? He defines good before he gets one chapter into the Bible, right? So we need to be able to look at that. And by the way, there's, word, there's other, other scriptures in your Bible that when he uses the word good differently, he explains it in the context. He says, they did that which is good in their own eyes. Is that good? Okay, so he explains that to you. Good means good, folks, okay? And bad means bad. Evil means evil, okay? Don't ever let somebody tell you that in the dispensation of the age of grace, God has a different view of sin, okay? Don't ever let someone tell you that sin is, well, it's all forgiven, therefore we don't look at it the same way in our lives, okay? Romans, Romans 6 and Romans 7 is before Romans 8, and we'll get there, but Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. I was looking at that, and I thought, you know what, how, how does that even work, okay? When we're talking about, and Bill did a great job on it last night, when we're talking about God loving us, I don't know about you, but... It's a whole lot easier to talk about God loving us than it is for to teach a type of reciprocation of that love. Meaning that there's such a thing as God caring about what we care about. Okay? There's such a thing as God caring what we're loading our emotions up into. Okay? There's, by the way, that term emotions, your, your, your feelings are a horrible boss to you, okay? They can cause you to, and me too, to do really stupid, immature things, right? So what you want to do is give those feelings some education, right? You, you want to get in the Word of God and find out how the Word of God can discern the thoughts and intents of your heart. The heart is the seat of your emotions. And it's important for us to have that type of discernment. So he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, is believers, according to their purpose. No, preacher, it says his purpose. Okay, it's not the purpose-driven life. Okay, some of you know what I'm talking about here. It's God's purpose. It's God's good. It's God's will. My nephew wrote a song, It's Not About You, It's All About Him, right? And that's, that's a really simplistic message that has a lot of heart to it. It's awesome. Them that love God. As I'm reading down through there, I'm like, you know what? 
Why is it that folks in a variety of areas want to talk about 2 Corinthians 5? Let's go there. 2 Corinthians 5. I cannot read this passage anymore without reading both verses because I, I learned that there's a deficit here. And I want to show you it really quick here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Most of you know this. If you've ever studied at all on the love of Christ, you, you went through this verse, right? Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. There's a colon there, folks. It didn't stop. Don't stop there, please. Punctuation is there for a reason. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live, that's Christians, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There's a reciprocation to that. And, and I know it's going to sound like a really nasty word, but there is such a thing as a duty involved. There's such a thing as a vocation okay Ephesians 4 the vocation wherewith you are called in the hope of your calling words mean something folks and when you think about that you can go over to Romans 12 and want to read about what it means to be a living sacrifice it's like the old guy said the problem with being a living sacrifice is it means you got to keep dying I'm like what you keep crawling off the altar right you know, a dead sacrifice, that's easy. Kill the guy, he ain't going nowhere, right? The dilemma, and this is the beautiful part. Let's go to Romans 6. I'll show you something real quick here. Something that I, I guess you'd say haggled with my own mind about for years. Because this gets taught at least three ways that I know of. So I'm sharing this with you. And you can haggle over it in your own head and heart when you get home and look at the verses or whatever. Or do it when your wife's driving or whatever. I do that on the way home all the time. We don't have far enough to drive for that this time. But Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, so you got to go back, read the context to get the gist of it. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Got a question for you. You're in three-part being. Spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, you know, the verses, okay? We're in three parts. However, you are in the body of Christ. You have two people in you. Old man, new man, okay? You got both in there, okay? Old man, new man. I got a loaded question for you. Can you serve either one of those anymore? Can you not serve either one of those anymore? Look at verse 13. Neither yield ye your members, that's your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So I'll ask you again. Can you serve either one of those anymore? Yes. Sure! Can Barney do what Barney wants to do in his flesh? Yeah! Barney gets irritated. I told Bill this last night. I was fessing up, okay? Bill had his Catholic collar on. No, just kidding. And... I looked at them and said, yeah, I said, when I'm tired, my flesh is like right there. Something about Barney's flesh and sleep, lack of it thereof. And so, you know, you have to, and he was saying, giving me some godly counsel of that too. But there is such a thing as, you know, you have to be aware where you're at, what you're doing, all right? Why is that? You ever ask yourself, why is it so difficult to have the victorious life principles if we have the life of Christ? If I'm completing Christ, why do I have to struggle with my old man? Why can't Barney do what it is he's supposed to be doing? If when God looks at you, he sees Christ, then why do I still have problems? Okay, you ever ask yourself that? I hope you do, by the way. I hope you do. Because you're not going to find the answers to that unless you get honest with Romans 6 through 8. And it's not an easy thing. It's, it's an arduous thing to understand. So let me show you something real quick here. Everybody knows I can't draw, okay? At home, I would, uh, 
I would uh, definitely make him black because my father had a four-color pen. He always used uh, he always used four-color pens for different things, and black was always. Uh, but I'll make this guy smile and that guy mean. Okay, just stupid figures. Okay, this man, according to Ephesians 4: 22 through 24, and the latter part of Romans 7, you have two people inside of you. You are schizophrenic. So am I. Right? Never ask a schizophrenic, who do you think you are? Okay? There's two of you in there, okay? There's an old man and a new man. Now, you can do all kinds of studying on that. You can take that home and please do be a Berean about it, Acts 17, 11. Search the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. I always found it amusing. I'll share this with you. Commercial break. Um, I always found it amusing that folks always talked about being a Berean when I was around Grace folks back in the 80s and stuff. Everybody, oh, we're Bereans, we're Bereans. And I got to thinking about it one day, 15, 20 years later, because it's been a while. And I thought, you know what? Paul never wrote a letter to them Bereans. All the stuff, he only mentions them once. And I'm like, maybe being a Berean is not, you know. On the other hand, the concept's good, right? What happened with the Thessalonians? Those are beloved brethren. They were in samples. They sounded out the word through all the regions of Achaia. And you check out your map, best you can figure out the geography on it. Berea was a little ways below Thessalonica there. I think the Thessalonians had a ball. I think the Thessalonians went down and affected those Bereans. Okay? There's, there's a lot more there. How many books did he write to the Thessalonians? Two. I mean, there's more there than what... I don't know about you guys, but you, some of you guys have been around long enough to know that 1 Corinthians 8.1 says, Knowledge puffeth up. If the reason that you're studying is to gather more head knowledge, that's the wrong motivation. We need to study. And 2 Timothy 2.15, if we keep reading the first part of it, we'll get that part right. Study to show yourself approved unto God. God's Word is designed to affect you. God's Word is designed to change you, okay? God's Word is designed to give you this discernment to understand this guy. So Barney knows who Barney is when he's in his flesh or when he's in the spirit of life of Christ, okay? Understanding your dual nature is vitally important. It will affect your relationships with your wife, your kids, how you're motivated, how you do ministry. I can share it with you quite honestly. I didn't do some of that stuff right. Some things I taught out of frustration because I knew it was wrong. And all I could think about at the time was Romans 12, 9. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Well, that's true. That's a great principle. But you also have to learn how to speak the truth in love so they can grow up into who? Me? No, preacher. And to grow up into Christ. I want to edify some folk. I'm going to build them up. I don't want to rattle their cogs. I do that in the energy of my flesh. I don't do a lot of things with one foot. I do them with both feet. But ultimately, that's, it, 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 it requires, in order to do it right, you've got to figure out how to get out of the way sometimes and allow the Holy Spirit of God to do the work through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. So you've got these dual natures here. Old man, new man. We won't go back and read it, although we should. Romans 7, you've read it multiple times, I hope. That which I do, I allow not. That which I cannot, that I do. Whole wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, wait a minute. Didn't he just say over there in Romans 6, 11, Reckon therefore yourselves to be dead? Why is he struggling in the latter part of Romans 7, recognizing that this guy right here produces death? Okay. Because that dead over there in Romans 6, 11 is not talking about annihilation. And if it was, in other words, it's not gone. Sin still resides in your flesh. That's what this guy has. And he's going to have it until he's six feet under or blown up or whatever happens to our body, right? So we need to recognize that. And the reason we need to recognize it is because there's something, I'm not going to get in Larry's stuff, but there's something out there going on called the satanic policy of evil. 
There's something going out there. Okay, you got to go there. 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is important. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In this long list about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, he's not talking about unbelievers and believers. He's talking about believers who have a decision to make who they're going to follow, their flesh or their spirit, okay, their renewed mind. So 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these. He's talking about people here. Vessels of dishonor. People who are willingly choosing to live a life of sin. Okay? And he's telling you that there can be a time in your life where you have to make a decision. My dad would say, draw a line in the sand. Okay? Don't cross that line kind of thing. Okay? He would say, you're going to have to decide who you're going to serve. God or the devil? And I always thought, well, that seems kind of harsh. It sounded right, but it seems kind of harsh. And one day I'm reading down through here, and it says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Here you go, guys. Two words. With them. Think about this, young folks. When you're down there playing and enjoying and the fellowship and the fun with other brothers and sisters in Christ, this is your prerequisite. This is your foundation of, to know how to fellowship with other people. Read this again. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There's going to be varying degrees in your spiritual maturity. There's going to be varying degrees in your brothers and sisters in Christ. Not everybody's going to do everything either the way that I think it should be done or the way that you think it's going to be done. But look at that qualifying factor there where he says, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We need to be sensitive to each other. We need to be able to look at that and go, you know, he might lack or she might lack in this area, and maybe I can help him over time with that, speaking the truth in love. But their motivation, their heart's motivation is to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Not that their heart remains perfect, although it, we can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, can't we? But there's, there's, there's such a thing as motivation that's important. Okay, very important. It's kind of a, a criteria for fellowship and, yes, relationship. I mean, you, you guys got to make decisions of who you hobnob with. You guys got to make this. I, I'll share this way. i get really real with you for a second here. When I was young, 16, 17, all the way through 22 or so, I had a correspondence deal. Okay, it was back before the Internet was prolific. All right. I literally hand wrote letters to a variety of folks. It was like a letter writing ministry I had when I was a teenager, okay? And I found out at a fairly short amount of time, the folks that would reciprocate and send stuff back to me and vice versa were interested. They were interested in a deeper level of fellowship, you know? And however you do those things in your older teens and going into your adult life matters. Whom, who you choose to rub your elbows with more than likely is going to, be a situation where those are the people that you're going to find spouses with eventually. Okay? So it matters. It matters to God. It should matter to you. Okay? So that's important. Okay? Let me finish this past before I forget what I'm doing. Um, verse 25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, that's this right here, we oppose ourselves. We really do. Um, flesh, spirit, you know, you read that conundrum in the latter part of Romans 7. That's what's going on there. So these guys are Christians who's opposing themselves, okay? If God peradventure will give them repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, 
to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they, they may recover themselves. You don't recover people. I didn't get that for a while. I'll sh share that with you. I struggled in the energy of my flesh to tell people things that I believe was right and true from God's Word, but I thought I was recovering them. I don't think I ever analytically looked at it like that, but that's what I was trying to do. We all are independently accountable for God for what we do. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Wow. Satan has a will. Satan has a course. Satan's got something he calls wiles of the devil, right? And we need to be aware of that. You guys need to be aware of that. Don't be disillusioned. If you're young enough and gullible enough to think that your parents don't have a clue what's going on in the world, read this. Figure out what that is. If you are, are, want to be responsible in your life, you go home and study it. Get your Bible concordance and pen out and you look up wiles and you look up will and you, you, you figure out what's going on out in the whole universe. You figure out why over there in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 it says Satan is the God, little g, the God of this world. That's why we know that our God in the heavens is not pulling strings to dictate all of the physical circumstances because he's working from the inside out. He gave us a part of himself in the ministry of the Holy Spirit so that we can function in this guy. There's your life, by the way. What's over here? Death. That's why Romans 6.11 says, Reckon therefore yourselves to be dead. Because if you live in this guy, you know what you do? You're a dead man walking. People talk about zombies. They don't have a clue. <laughs> My wife kept telling me, you're going to have to write a song, A Dead Man Walking. If I had it ready, I'd have sang it for you, but it's not ready. But anyway, I wrote one finally. And there's some truth to that. You need to see that as counterproductive to anything that you can do to serve God. Okay? But don't ever forget what Brother Larry was saying when that old guy kept going, you can't. I can't. I can't do it. Okay? So the life of Christ and the function of the life of Christ is when we let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16, is when we yield your members. That's up to you, by the way. That's not up to anybody else. Okay? Yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And the only way that righteousness comes out of you is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that new life, that new man that God gave you, okay? Because we can oppose ourselves. We're schizophrenic. We're dual nature, old man, new man. And we need to be able to understand that that crazy condemnation, that bad feeling, that bad, oh, sorrow, wretched man that we are kind of thing you can, we can, have you blamed somebody else for something you did? Man, you know. Or made excuses for something you chose to do? Can, can I share with you at 57 years of age, especially with men, I don't have a lot of patience with that anymore. I'm old enough to, 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 to look through that and go, uh-uh. If you made a decision, how's that silly thing go? The guy was out going to take a jog, all right? Decides to get jog, gets his tinnies on. You know, I like jogging once in a while. Not like Scott. Scott can go. But anyway, and he gets out, opens up his door, and goes out and takes a jog around the house. And he's about halfway around the block. And he sees something out of the corner of the eye. looks like a little orange pylon or a sign. He's not really paying attention. He's just jogging. Not having the kind of discernment you're supposed to have when you're jogging, all right? And he, he kind of jumps over the sign, falls down a manhole. Boom, you know, about six feet. Boom. Oh, man. Climbs back up the ladder, gets back on the road. A little bruised, but he gets back on the road. Okay. Goes back home. That was a rough run this morning, you know. Gets up the next morning, drinks a cup of coffee, gets back out, going to take another jog, right? Opens up the door, goes around the block, 
again, sees something out of the corner of his eye, jumps right over the sign into the manhole again. It may sound like a crazy thing to do. Why didn't he pay attention? Well, we do that in our lives. You do that in your lives. Make stupid decisions when we should have had the discernment to go, wait a minute, there's a sign. Here's your sign, right? We do crazy stuff. I do crazy stuff. My wife tells me all the time, slow down. I never forget one time I was at a four-way. It was one of those crazy, it wasn't a, uh, what do you call those? Not lazy Susan, what's it? Roundabouts, I hate those. But anyway, <laughs> I can't understand them. I want to go through the center. But anyway, I, I'm not a good merger, okay? But anyway, <laughs> my idea of merging is pushing along skinny pedals, see what happens. Anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, where was I going? Oh, yeah, get to the, to the four-way stop, okay? And I'm in a hurry, and I'm pushy, and I'm pushing myself, and I'm going to push everybody else kind of thing, all right? I'm in the flash, basically, okay? This guy's rolling, okay? This guy's pushing the long skinny pedal. He's, he's operating pretty vis vociferously, I guess is what you say. Anyway, I come to this stop sign, and I'm thinking in my mind, okay, who's the idiot that got there first and caused the light to change? I can't go. And I'm looking over to my right, really wanting to see... Somebody with purple hair, smoking. Something I can look at and, and just judge to make my flesh feel better about why I'm mad. Really? Yeah, that's where I was at that day, okay. And I look over there, and this guy's got the perfect haircut. Looked like he just got out of the Marines. And he's just, and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, because my next spot is, okay, I don't know if he's a Christian, but the guy obviously has it together. Just physically speaking, he's not, he's not upset. He's not yelling at me. I get that too, don't get me wrong. But, you know, and I'm going through all this, and I'm like, that guy has just as much right to be there as I do. What am I doing? You know? And you, you got to assess that. You've you got to be able to see this guy for who he is. He will work death in your life. He will cause you to have the condemnation and the old wretched man syndrome that God doesn't want you to live in. God does, it did not design you to live in the tyranny of your emotions. And we do that sometimes. Man, that's a hard thing. I talk to people and they tell me about things that happened to them years ago that were damaging emotions and feelings or whatever they were, and sometimes physical or emotional damage. We've all got them. Can I share with you? I have them. Yeah, as a second-generation grace believer, as a second-generation homeschooler even. I was in the pioneer era. It was illegal then. But anyway, um, I share that with you because we all have problems. We're all human. We've all got that dead guy, Okay. But when you strap him on your back and you jump out of the airplane, you ain't, you're going someplace fast but not where you want to be. Kind of like that thing where it said, use parachute. Use once, never opened. <laughs> not a good thing, okay? So you, can, you guys, we decide. You decide what, how you're going to live your life. Are you going to live it in death? You're going to make those decisions in your life on an ongoing basis? Or are you going to live the life of the life of Christ? I mean, that's where we're at. It's an ongoing decision, by the way. You don't make, that, you don't make this decision once. You make it ongoing. Okay, Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because I'm so far off my notes I can't think straight. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6, for God who commanded the, commanded the light to shine out of darkness, creation, hath shined in our hearts, Romans 5, 5, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Romans 8, 29. You need to know what that looks like, by the way. You need to know what it means to be conformed to the image of Christ. You need to know what it means to be to let this mind, this thinking process, be in you. 
which was also in Christ. God is not in the business of yanking strings, causing you to individually do things in life that pleases Him. That's not how the will of God happens. Okay? The will of God happens when we let, when we yield, when we get out of the way, when we realize we can't. I don't know about you, but when I was struggling with a lot of things in my flesh as a young Christian, not so young Christian actually, I kept quoting to myself the second half of Romans 13, 14. Couldn't remember the first half, and that was the problem because I couldn't remember it. And it was, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So I made no provision for the flesh. I chose not to go to that gas station with pornography on the shelf because I had an issue with that. My flesh had an issue with that. I chose to deny this. I chose to deny that. Now, denying is okay. You can read that in Titus 2. But the point is, I was doing it by trying to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Okay? And that only lasts so long. You're going to fall. Romans 7, that which I do, I honor, that which I cannot, that I do. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, when you re realize it's the sin that dwelleth in you, in your body, it's helpful because it's very counterproductive to live a life of death, right? It is. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. But for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Nasty, what, what Larry was saying, mud jugs or something. You know. We're so worthless, you know, in a, in a very real way. But you know what? The love of God is what changes that. Okay? The love of God is designed to constrain you. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, if you would. I got to thinking about this one day, and I looked at it, and I read that verse, and read that verse about the love of Christ. And I'm like, how can the love of Christ constrain us? How can looking back at the cross and God giving His only Son to die on the cross be all we need to live our life. Well, it is because it'll, it gives us some things. And I could sit here and go into another hour and a half. I'm not going to do that. About what we richly get when we become a child of God. He's freely given us all things. And I've also been saying for several years, I'm going to teach a message on all things. Haven't done it yet, sorry. But... He's given us so much, but often we don't know what we have. We just don't know. How many people here, when you clean a house, okay, it's time for confession. <laughs> when you clean a house, you don't have much time and you're pushing yourself and you just shove it all under the bed or in the closet, all right? Get it done. Get it, you, got, you got too many other things to do, just shove it in the bed or in the closet. The only dilemma with that is, when you, you don't remember what's in the closet, for one. Somewhere, I'm missing something I was supposed to have here this week, and it's not here. I have no idea where it's at. We just moved four months ago. I'm not the most organized person right now. But in, in your life, when you keep pushing things out of your way without dealing with them, without putting them where they belong, they can cause you a lot of grief. When you leave the burner on, there's always that threat of burning something you're not supposed to burn. I left some water on this morning. <laughs> Made a big, huge puddle on the floor, you know. So he says here in Ephesians 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So there's a process there, by the way. Do you think what he's saying is just knowing the gospel of the grace of God is enough to be able to empower you to live the life of Christ in your, in your flesh? 
I think there's more to it. I think there's some things that we're lacking at times in our, in our walk, okay? Look at verse 18. May be able to comprehend. May be able. So there's sounds like that there could be a situation where we're not able to comprehend some things, right? With all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ. We don't automatically know the love of Christ just because we understand that He died on the cross for our sins. We know the beginning of it, but there's an awful lot more involved than that, okay? We need to grow up into that, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Who is Christ? How does Christ think? What is the mind of Christ? It says we have it over there in 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have the mind of Christ. It means it's available to us. It doesn't mean he dumped a certain amount into you. I'm just saying it's available, right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, right? So this love that is supposed to constrain us, that's not your love. That's not your emotions. That's not your warm feelings, okay? Go to Philippians chapter 1, trying to wind this up without getting wound up again. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians 1. I used to close my letters in my young life with this verse because it was so unusual to me. Philippians 1 verse 9. And this I pray that your love... So Paul's saying the people that he's writing this letter to, your love, not the love of Christ, your love, okay? I, this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Wow. How many times do we associate the word love with knowledge and growth and understanding? Can I share with you if, you, if you, if you think that love is just a warm feeling, which you can get sitting on the wrong thing, okay? You need, you need to get this verse, okay? And you need to get this verse before you get married to somebody because you think you love them, okay? Or they love you, okay? Can I share with you, and I do this a lot now, I'm sorry, kind of, The love that you have for another human being to where you want to marry them is a beautiful thing. God said it is. But that love, that human love, can fail and fall very short for the other person and vice versa. After 28 years of marriage, I can tell you that sometimes I don't love my wife. I love me not my wife. My wife may not love me the same way sometimes. What keeps that together, by the way, is the love of Christ. You learn about that love of Christ. Can I share with you, when you learn about the love of Christ, you can learn to love somebody else correctly. The depth of your relationships changes radically. You can care about them when they're not caring about you anymore. You can learn about that difference. You can learn about forbearance. You can learn about patience and charity, seeking not your own, vaunting not yourself, all that stuff. That's what charity is about. It says slowly, slowly, calm down on my notes right here. <laughs> wonder why it does that. Um... <laughs> Okay, 1 Timothy 1. I don't really have time to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. It won't take that long, I think. 1 Timothy 1, because there were some things that were brought up earlier in the week, and I really wanted to do this. So, 1 Timothy 1. Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a... Pure heart. 
By the way, charity, it, as I understand it so far, is the truth in love from God's Word. Charity over there in Colossians 3.14, it says, is the bond of perfectness. It's the cohesion. It's that, that thing that holds us together, okay? Charity seeketh not her own, bondeth not itself. You read that, 1 Corinthians 13. That's not love, by the way. It's charity. That's not your love either, okay? It's the love of Christ compiled by the truths of God's Word. It's, it's, some people say love in action, but it could be my love in action to be wrong. I want you to, to understand that, okay? The love of money is the root of all evil. Love in your Bible is not always the right type of love. I mean, obviously. So, you know, he loved her and he did this and that and the other. Well, that's not the right kind of love, okay? Then uh, her brothers killed him, right? <laughs> you read the story. So anyway, 1 Timothy 1, verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So in this verse 7, I believe what he's saying here is their desire to teach the law wasn't the biggest problem. The problem was they did not understand it, right? Okay? And they didn't understand it. So, verse 8. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Question, how do you use the law right and lawfully in the dispensation age of grace? As a second generation grace believer, I'm like, wow, when I read this, it smacked me upside the head. Okay, verse 9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. And don't stop there and say, oh yeah, we're righteous positionally, this is not for us. Keep reading. Don't kid yourself, okay? Be honest with the scripture. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. Can I still be disobedient? That guy can, okay? For the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves and mankind, for men steal, for liars. I still lie. I'm not proud of it, but I still lie. For them that defile, where does it mean? Perjurious persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The law is productive because it shows us when we do things that are contrary to sound doctrine? How can that be? Isn't that crazy? Go to Galatians chapter 5. Well, by the way, the next verse says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. So Paul's gospel is saying that the law is going to show you when you sin. Hello. There's a whole different concept there. That's heavy. That's, by the way, that's high school stuff. That's not grade school stuff. If you're not ready for it, I get it. I'm sorry, but that's what it's saying. Okay? Still home and study it. Don't take my word for it. Just read it. Galatians 5, and we'll slow down again. Hopefully calm down because it's 12 noon. I hear bells dinging. No, just kidding. Galatians 5. The conundrum of the walk of the flesh and spirit, okay, is listed here similarly as it is in Romans 7, okay? Look at Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary one to the other, these guys here, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Well, it sounds like Romans 7 to me. But, verse 18, if ye be led of the Spirit, if God comes over and clips a leash on your nose and leads you to... That's not how the leading of the Spirit is. It says let, yield, reckon, know, comprehend. That's up to us. We're teaching responsible grace. We're not teaching God is going to change. That's not what we're teaching here. God's design for the body of Christ is to work from the inside out, not to manipulate physical circumstances so you don't have to do anything. That's not what God's will is. It's to, you know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. 
Prove the will of God in your life. Proving that which is good and acceptable for the will of God there in Romans 12 too. It's been made known, Ephesians 1, 9. We can understand it, Ephesians 5, 17. It's not a nebulous pin the tail on the donkey, that kind of thing. So here we are, Galatians 5, 18. But if, if, why? That's a horrible word, isn't it? If, if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. That's the understanding and answer to the folks that try to teach Romans 6.14 as positional truth. Okay? We're not under the law, but under grace. We're not under the law, but under grace. He just said, yield your members in the verse before. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness. And that guy right there, by the way, is under the law till the day he dies because all he can do is sin. That sin might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. That's the law, folks. Romans 7. The law is holy and just and good. Your apostle said that. I, I said it too, but I'm just repeating what he said. The law is holy and just and good. And he's not saying the law was holy. He's saying the law is holy. It didn't change. The reason why God needed the law was to show sin. We know this. We teach the gospel. You can't teach the gospel without telling somebody they're a sinner. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. There's nothing, there's nothing fun about guilt. There's nothing fun about shame. And there's nothing fun about shame in the life of the believer either. My mom, like I say, my mom used to say before she paddled me, she'd say, I don't love sin in your life and I don't love it in my life either. And I thank God for that. It's a beautiful thing. Know who that guy is. Know who he is in your life. Because he's, he's your public enemy number one, okay? Satan out there has a will. This guy, all by himself, will do the will of Satan every time. Know that. The Bible says you can be taken captive by him at his will. You can't be taken captive by Satan as a Christian if you're doing this. That's where your life is. But when you choose to do this, what happens? You wonder why you feel like you do? You're quenching the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. I know I've done it. That's why he says, like Brother Campbell just said, it says to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's you making those decisions. That's not somebody else doing it for you. That's, that's, that's not lazy grace, folks. We're not teaching lazy grace. That grace may abound as if that's something positive. God forbid. That's a harsh thing, but it's, it's true. So how do I wind this up? Go back to 2 Corinthians 5, if you would, and try to calm down and... Second Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ constraineth us. So we need to know what that looks like. We need to grow up into that. We need to be rooted and grounded in that love. Okay? Because it can constrain us. It says that right there, right? Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That guy right there is dead, right? And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There is victorious life when you understand that the life of Christ can actually be manifest in your mortal flesh. Second Corinthians 4, I didn't read it. I, got, I didn't get that part, but... There's victorious life. There's, how can I say, satisfaction knowing that you allowed 
Christ to live out of you? There's peace there. There's comfort there. There's, there's, y- y- you don't have to struggle. There is a warring, though. There is a warring going on. But if you're trying to struggle and make it happen yourself, that's this guy trying to do it. Okay, been there, done that. I didn't finish my illustration about that. Romans thirteen fourteen says, "Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof." And again, I was trying to do that in the energy of my flesh. But the first part of that verse says, "I've got to look at it again. It's still blocked. Satan's blocking it or something. I don't know. Anyway, I'll behave." Uh, Romans thirteen fourteen. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision and so forth. So if we don't if we don't put this guy on, we're not gonna be able to make no provision for the flesh. See that? All we are is a vessel. Okay. A lot of times we like to think of ourselves as a whole lot more than that, but that's what we are. We're a vessel. First Corinthians six nineteen says we're bought with a price. You know what that price is, and we're to glorify God in our body. We can't do that in the energy of our flesh. I can't. <laughs> it's true. But when we l- realize that the life of Christ is actually designed to live out through us, I got to do this. It's a crazy idea in my head. Okay, nah. It you, it goes from conduit, okay? Who knows about a, who knows what a conduit is, okay? A conduit to can do it, okay? Because you can't do it, but if you allow the energy of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God to effectually work in you that believe, then you can do it. One more verse and I'll quit. Ephesians 3. This is the best verse that I know of to help explain that conduit, can do it thing. Romans or Ephesians three, verse twenty. Now unto him that is able, is God able? Absolutely. To do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that comes upon us. No, preacher. Say that. I don't find with that. If I'm reading it wrong, you stop me. Okay? According to the power that worketh in us. It goes from conduit to can do it. He made us able. Okay? How we are able is from this. Okay? You have the life of Christ in you. Don't lie to yourself and tell you that you can't do it anymore. You can in the sense that part of you has a new man. Okay? You just have to realize part of you is bad news and part of you is the victorious life of Christ. That's what that resurrection life is over there in Philippians 3. Okay? You conduit is the best method, okay? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the mystery's about. That's what the grace gospel's about. And it's not just about time past, but now and ages to come. It's about the function of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And it's a beautiful thing. Okay, let's close. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've given us. Thank you for giving us the availability of the absolutes of your word to read, study, and get honest with and uh, enjoy the rich fellowship of each other as we discuss the things of God's word and to learn more about your love, to learn more about your truth and how those two work together, how we can be rooted, built, and established in him and make good decisions down here based upon information from your word so that we can actually prove out the will of God in our lives. And thank you for those opportunities that we have in this life to glorify you. In your name we pray, amen.